This video is about subspaces, but before we start talking about that, let's talk a little bit about sets in general. If I have a set of a bunch of things, all of which are red, I might classify them by putting them together here in a, in a circle. Here's an apple that's red. Of course, I might have a green apple that would not be in the set of red things. Might have a, a red pair of shoes. Let's see, a Valentine's Day card. Well, I'll just call it a heart. What else might be red? Maybe my favorite car. And then let's also say that I have a collection of things called shoes. I'll make sure these shoes are labeled as red shoes. Um, maybe I have some sandals and some uh, boots, uh, maybe some cross trainers. These are all shoes, right? But this pair right here, they're also red. So if I put a circle around all the, the things that are shoes, then I have to include the red shoes in that circle. But the red shoes are already in the circle of all the things that are red. Each one of these collections we call a set. This piece in the middle here is a subset. It belongs in, the, the thing in here belongs to the collection of red things, but it's not the entire collection of red things. It's only a partial collection. I might have more than one pair of red shoes in the subset, or technically, I guess I could say I might not have any. I might not have any things in my master collection here that are both red and shoes, in which case the subset would be empty. A subspace is kind of like that. A subspace of Rn is a subset of Rn, but it also has to be a vector space. Remember that we said uh, a collection of things in Rn. Let's use R3 as our example. The collection of things in R3 are basically triples, ordered triples. If we say that if we attach certain properties to those triples, then we can call them vectors. And that makes R3 a vector space. And we also see this notation and this notation. OK, these are all representative of an element of R3. But the bottom three are vectors. They're all the same vector in different, uh, slightly different notations. If you could find a way to collect all of the vectors that met the criterion that they had three components and that those components were real numbers, then you would have the vector space in R3. To be a subspace, only two of the 10 criteria have to be met, but there's one additional one that wasn't mentioned before, and that's this. The first one is that the zero vector has to be in an element of, a member of, that, that space. We're trying to define a subspace. We're going to say that W, this capital W, is a subspace of Rn if the zero vector is one of the vectors in that subspace. Now, that's not the only criteria that has to be met. All three of the following criteria must be met if we're going to call this a subspace, but that's one of them. And that's actually not one that we required of our space in general, uh, except that since every component of a vector in a vector space has to be a real number, and since all real numbers are candidates for that role, then one of our vectors is going to be the zero, ve the zero vector. So that specific vector, this is in R3, this is my R3 example, that specific vector 
has to be in R3 if the subset W, a smaller group of all the vectors in Rn, uh, if that smaller group, that subset, is going to be a subspace, one of the criteria is that the zero vector has to be in that subset. The other two are the first two criteria of just being a vector space, and that is that we have to have closure under addition and closure under scalar multiplication. Now, on the surface, that seems pretty straightforward, right? If we have two vectors in R3, say, for example, and we know that the, one of the properties of a uh, vector space is that we have closure under vector addition, then the assumption might be that if you take two vectors in R3 and add them together, they're automatically going to be in that subspace. The thing is, they might, the, the individual vectors may be in the subset, in the subspace. Well, it's not a subspace unless these criteria are met, so we'll call it a subset. The individual vectors may be in the subset, but there's some may not be. If that happens, then W is not a subspace because it doesn't meet this criteria. Equally, closure under scalar multiplication. So for example, let's say that I, I took a subset of vectors in R3. Uh, I'll, call it, I'll call it U. U is the collection or the set of all vectors in R3 in quadrant 2. Well, the thing about those vectors is that they're going to look like this, where x is less than 0 and y is greater than 0. That's what it means to be in quadrant 2, right? Vectors in quadrant 2 will have a negative x component and a positive y component. If I grab just two of those, let's say negative 1, 3, and negative 2, 5, and add them together, I'll get negative 3, 8, which is in quadrant 2. So this subset, u, is closed under vector addition. That criterion is met. Now I'm going to erase some of what I did down here on the bottom right uh, corner of my screen because I, I've run out of room, as is typical for me. Um, and I want to do, I want to test closure under scalar multiplication. So I'll, I'll leave the first vector there. Notice that I've just grabbed a random vector from my subset. Uh, and I want to scale that by a number. If I scale it by 2, I get negative 2, 6. Well, that is in, uh, that's in the second quadrant. So on the surface, it looks like u is closed under scalar multiplication as well. But when you want to try to prove something is not true, the way to do that is to find a counterexample. So find a number to scale this by that results in a vector that is not in the second quadrant. And then negative, any negative number is going to do that, right? This is going to give me the vector 1, negative 3 the vector 1, negative 3 is in quadrant 4. So this set, this subset u of all vectors in, oh, I've said R3, and I'm giving you vectors in R2. So let me change that real quick. My apologies. The same principles hold. And actually, R2 may be a little bit easier to, to work with to see what's going on. So when I scaled this by a negative number, I got a, uh, a vector that's not back in quadrant two. That was the, that was the requirement. That was the, the subgroup or the subset of vectors that I chose to work with. That's the, that's the subset of all vectors in R2 that have to be in quad, to be in U, they have to be in quadrant two. Well, this is not, this, this subset is not closed under scalar multiplication. So that means that U is not a subspace of R2. There's actually one other thing here to think about, and that is the zero vector must also be in the, in the subset uh, U. It doesn't really matter. I already know that U is not a subspace because it doesn't meet the third criterion here. But as a matter of interest, let's take a look at what it means 
to be a zero vector in U. To be a zero vector means to have magnitudes, among other things, means to have magnitude zero, right? The zero vector has the coordinates zero, zero, but the magnitude of that vector is also zero. So is there a vector that goes into quadrant two that has a magnitude of zero? And I would argue yes and no, right? There's my zero vector, it's just the arrowhead. There is, a, there is a zero vector, because it's a zero, because it has magnitude zero, it doesn't matter what its orientation is. So we can argue that, sure, it can point into quadrant two. A zero vector uh, pointing into quadrant two satisfies this criterion for uh, U being a subspace. Uh, we can say that zero is, uh, the zero vector is a member of the subset of vectors of R2 that are in U because it's in quadrant two. On the other hand though, the way we've defined um, the x, y, the vector x, y, because we're saying that the, the vectors are all in quadrant two, the x coordinate has to be less than zero and the y coordinate has to be greater than zero. The way we've defined it, it looks like it can't be. So we might need to be careful and redefine these so that x is less than or equal to zero. That would certainly put our zero vector into quadrant two because now we have x and y can equal zero and then our vector can point into quadrant two. On the third hand, the question you might wanna ask is if that vector can point into any of the four quadrants, how do we know it's pointing into the second quadrant? Since the vectors in U all have to be in quadrant two, or they all start from quadrant two. That's where all of those vectors are located. In order for the zero vector to be a member of this subcollection subset, it also has to be in the second quadrant. Is it or not? I'm just gonna leave that one with you to let you think about for a little bit. It's not too onerous in that most of the exercises that you'll be asked to do don't actually address this first criterion at all. Um, and there's, there's kind of a reason for that, but I'm gonna let you just think about that. So to be a subspace, you either define or you have defined for you what the restrictions or what the requirements are for the vectors in that subspace. Uh, in this example, we had vectors in quadrant two. You might have vectors for which the second component was one third the size of the first component, or vectors for which the product of the two vectors was always a specific number, for example. There are lots of different criteria, lots of different restrictions you can put on R2 to come up with a subset. And then we tested to find out if the zero vector was in the subset, to find out if we added two vectors together, uh, would that new vector be in the subset? And to find out if we scaled that vector, would the new vector be in the subset? Those are the three things that have to happen for, uh, for the subset we've come up with to be considered a subspace. When you do the exercises in the textbook, in particular, I'm looking at the participation activity 4.1.3. Notice that when the answer is, yes, this is a subspace, it's a longer answer because they've had to check each of the three criteria. The zero vector is in the subset. The subset is closed under vector addition. You add two vectors together that come from the subset, and the, the result is always also in the subset. And scalar addition is, uh, the subset is closed under scalar addition. If the answer is incorrect, if the answer is that it's not a subspace, then the answer is actually really short because all they've had to do is come up with one example of one of the criteria that doesn't work. For example, in part two of that question, the subset is defined as the vectors x1, x2 in R2. So that x1, x2 is an element of R2, that's the, that's the vector space. And W is being uh, defined as the subset of that vector space where X1 is greater than or equal to zero and X2 is greater than or equal to zero. In other words, both 
components are positive, which puts all of those vectors in the first quadrant. Now, if I scale that with a negative number, my new vector is not going to be in the first quadrant. That's the only thing I need to, to say about it. I can test all three criteria, but I only need to find one that fails to be able to answer this is not a subspace.